listening to the Weird Rap Podcast, Episode 8, with Odd Nostom and Illogic. I'll also be doing a little book report on Reese Langston's Language Arts Unit. I'll have a couple album recommendations. I'll be talking about the Waiting for Reparations podcast. And I'll be doing a tribute to Shock G, who we recently lost. We're going to start it off with Odd Nostom. We're going to talk about his new EP with Illogic, his history with Anticon, his work with Circus and Serengeti, and his creative process. So here we go. It's David Madsen, a.k.a. Bloody Knuckles O'Toole. It's a pleasure <laughs> to have you, sir. Thank you for joining the Weird Rap Podcast. You got it. Here, here, here we go. Bloody right. Knuckles O'Toole. <laughs> You're going way back with that one. We, we may get into that. But uh, I, I initially contacted you because I was really into the new EP with Illogic. It's called Write the Ship. Yes. It's a nice, uh, easily digestible EP of about 12 minutes long. Yep. Yeah, I think Traffic Jam has to be my favorite, but uh, I really love the whole thing. I think it's great through and through. Yeah, I just wonder what, what you can tell us about the project, how it come together, and what was the process? Well, you know, I met a logic... Uh, in Cincinnati in 1998 and he got on the, the very first Cloud Dead recording that we did. Um, this was before we even called it Cloud Dead. We, we, uh, we called it Green Think at that time. Anyways, uh, and I, I hadn't seen a logic in person for probably 20 years, you know, but I always follow his work. And randomly some guy named Ryan Harris on Twitter, you know, he put out a tweet. He was like, a logic and I know Stom should collaborate. And I, you know, I was sitting on beats like the traffic jam beat, you know, and I was sitting on these beats and I was like, oh, you know, what? like, why not? Like, I'll, you know, I like, I like a logic a lot. I think he's a great rapper. He's got a lot to say and, you know, and why not reconnect? And, um, I hit up a logic on Twitter. I was like, yo, you want to do this? And he was like, sure. So I just floated, I floated the logic a couple beats and he, you know, I think the first one we did was traffic jam and we were both really happy with the results. And we just kept going, you know, but then I got kicked out of my studio. Like I had two studios at the time when I was working with the logic, this was like 2018, 2019. And I got kicked out of my second studio, which is where I did all my mixing and mastering. Ah. So I wasn't, I wasn't able to complete all the songs that we did. Um, so we just settled on like, let's just put the music out, let people hear it. So what if it's short, you know, it's, it's got a lot of replay value. I think, you know, you could put it on loop and just, you know, Bang your fucking head, you know. Mango majesty and fickle fantasy collide with hopes of amnesty for past endeavors. The repetition is practiced in evolution seen as deficiency apparatus. If you have access to spin an access of their own. My man Zach, he'll be interviewing Illogic, so we'll go Next. more deeply into the EP. But you mentioned uh the early days of Green Think in Cincinnati. If we can, I'd like to document some history. Can you talk about how you originally linked up with Dose and Y and how the early pre Anticon formation started happening? Yeah. Um, so I knew, I've, I've known Yoni since like the early 80s. Uh, uh, Yoni's older brother, Josiah, who's the drummer in, uh, in the Y band, um, him and I were friends pretty much since like first grade, which was 1981. Mm. And so I, I, I would go over to Josiah and uh, Yoni and Josiah's house and, you know, I'd have dinner, we'd hang out, play video games and what, you know, what, whatever kids do. And, um, so Yoni was always like this little kid, you know, like knee high, literally like, cause you like this tiny little kid and I watched him grow up. And then, you know, he was, I'm four, I, th I think I'm three and a half or four years older than him. So like when, when I graduated high school, he was just getting into high school. And so I didn't see him much. And then, when he graduated high school, I think it was in 98, 1998, I was at a record store that I, like my favorite record store in Cincinnati called Everybody's Records. And that's where I used to buy all my rap tapes and, you know, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And he just randomly showed up at Everybody's Records and he had, he had like a little uh, poofy afro and he was all like hip hopped out. And he was like, yo, what's up? And I was like, oh shit, I haven't seen you in years. And he's like, yo, you should come through. 
to this rehearsal that I'm doing with this band called Apogee. And I was like, what the fuck is Apogee? And he was like, we, we got this rapper named Dose One. Uh, we got Mr. Dibs on the turntables and Josiah's playing drums. So I was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll show up. Um, so I went to this rehearsal. And that's where I met Dose One. Uh, you know, he was rapping his ass off and I was like really impressed. And they took a break from rehearsing and I was like, Yoni, you should come out to, you know, come out to my car and let me, let me play these beats that I'm working on. And at the time I was really into building car stereos and I was really good at it. Like I had a booming ass system in my car. And so like I played Yoni my first tape, which is called Anecdotic Self-Portrait. Right. He was he was cool with it. He was like, yeah, this sounds good. So I gave him the tape, and then like three months later, Yoni called me and he was like, hey, uh, Dose One and, and and I want you to come over and let's work on some music. So I came over and they also had a Doctor Sample Two Hundred Two, which was the you know which is what I was using at the time. And um, I don't know, it just happened really naturally. Just we just started hanging out more often, and we just were working on music. And then I would like go to Apogee shows and. Um, I got to open for Apogee. The very first time I played live was opening for Apogee on Halloween uh, in 1998. And that was like kind of when I guess I got really sucked into the whole scene that was popping off. Like there, there was not much going on in Cincinnati, but we had Scribble Jam and of course Dose One battled uh, Eminem. Right before Eminem blew up and you know that that's how Yoni met Dose One was Yoni was at Scribble Jam, he saw Dose One battle Eminem and then ran into uh Dose One at on the UC campus in Cincinnati and they just hit it off and it's a long story, but yeah, that, that, that's the gist of it. And like, I, it just happened very naturally. It was just like, you know, like I would go over there with, you know, with samples and, you know, like loops and stuff. And we would just record stuff. And, you know, and I, I contributed to both Green Think albums. I think the second Green Think album, the, the Blindfold, I did more production on that than I did on the first Green Think. Uh-huh. Uh, and it just, somehow it just turned into this thing called Cloud Dead. I mean, it didn't, it wasn't this like premeditated, it was just, it just was very natural, very, very, very natural. And when we were working on that music, the the, the early Cloud Dead stuff, like we had no idea that we were going to put it out on like a record label. It was just like, just fun to work on. So a logic was in the building one day while we were working on the, what became the very first track on the first cloud dead album. And we were like, yo, get, get on this track. And he, you know, he did his thing. Change your face shapes, personality switch, transformation. So impersonation of self, these crowds and two friends in the great shots in the basement, choking the puppet on the pedestal, let us stool, pigeon escort those to two or three doors down into the left door on the right hand side. My hand slides into pockets, pull sockets of lead, penalty orbits of red energy, enter in the orbit of the orbit northern and southern hemisphere of play caps. People know about Cloud Dead, I guess, you know, to an extent, and it is what it is. And- it's a classic album in my book. Yeah, if, if anyone <laughs> happens to be listening and they're not familiar, immediately go check out Cloud Dead. But yeah, I want to talk about too, like your production, because when I first heard your production, I did not understand it. <laughs> I didn't understand that you were probably intentionally very lo-fi and with with the tape noise and the hiss and the buzzes and everything and i was like geez like the rappers are awesome but the the production they could like turn up the fidelity a bit you know 
but it took me <laughs> it took me a little while to realize that this was actually an aesthetic you were going for. And at the time, this was kind of rare, especially in hip hop, you know, oh, yeah. like it wasn't so much done. And previous to that, I had been way into like Lou Barlow and early lo-fi home recording, like indie rock, indie folk kind of stuff. But it didn't, I didn't yeah. put two and two together that that's maybe what you were kind of trying to do. But what influenced you to, to take that approach to hip hop? Uh you know, I mean, like you said, like Lou Barlow, like Sebado. You've been broken for a long time. Swallowing what you deserve. You think you're dirt, so it's dirt you suck. For me, like, I was a hip hop kid f- since the early 80s always been in, like we, we didn't even call it hip-hop it, like to us it was like electro or break dancing music we didn't even know what to call the music right yeah. and it was like whatever was on the radio and you know like i used to make tapes like you know like you, you hear these stories all the time like the first time i heard scratching was on rocket by you know herbie hancock sure. and, you know and like you hear these like these you're like trying to tune your your radio station in to where you can get like a clean sound and you know of course you you dump that to tape and then you know the tape sounds like crap and you know you just it, it's it's like this kind of just in my dna i guess and like well you know i grew up in cincinnati ohio so there was only so much access that i could have to you know being on the radio and you know you, I'd, I'd hear this music and it just it was never very high fi it was always kind of just you know like radio static or you know mm-hmm. too many tapes dub to dub you know dub tapes and but when I got like when I graduated high school, which was in 1994, I started to get bored of hip hop. You know, like I, I think it was like the like tribes tribe called Quest, their album Beats, Rhymes, and Life. I think after that album, I was just like, you know what? Like I need to expand. Like I need to get beyond hip hop because this shit is just not. You know, all the, all that money rap that started coming out, and you know the Biggie Puffy era. Like you know, like no disrespect to none of those people, but like I just lost interest in that music. Even like Wu Tang, like I just just lost interest you know and, and yeah. started digging into other types of music in particular like shoegaze and ambient um like you know obviously like my bloody valentine and stars of the lid And, uh, but I, but I also like, I was huge into like bands like, uh, guided by voices, um, who are from Dayton, Ohio, which is like just, you know, a couple hours North of where I grew up. So I, I I had access through my, the record store that I I would always go to called since, uh, everybody's records in Cincinnati. And they, they would have all the guided by voices on vinyl, all the seven inches, all the, you know, LPs on wax. My cyber son is found My gun My favorite son is found So I would just buy all that stuff and just, you know, just dive in. And I just, you know, I mean, I was going to art school at the time and I was like, let me try making music. Let me just see what happens. Like, I'm going to, you know, and, and I just had this, it wasn't deliberate. It was just kind of like, I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And things were just coming out very like, noisy and, I didn't know how to plug certain cables in correctly. You know, the things were just like, it was a mess. I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I eventually realized that there was a sound there that appealed to me. Like it reminded me of, like you said, like Lou Barlow and, you know, or guided by voices, you know, and, and yeah. the sort of heavier aspect of, of like my bloody Valentine, like just that thick, heavy sound. And, and, you know, like I was working with the fucking eight track and a, dr sample 202 so i didn't really have you know I, I i didn't understand compression i didn't even know what compression meant you know like i didn't know how to use eq so i was just learning out as i was going you know and and but but i would put the music out if you listen to the first cloud dead album you can hear the very beginnings of my sound and how it progresses yeah as the album progresses and you know that wasn't intentional that was just what it, what happened you know like i just started to get more familiar with my equipment and 
ways of EQing stuff. And, but yeah, I mean, you know, like, again, like I was a hip hop kid and I just started dabbling in like more lo-fi type music, more ambient style music. And there you go. Yeah. And like you said, you know, you can hear the, the evolution over time where I feel like over the years you've really fine tuned and even more fully embraced that lo-fi sound, but with, uh, with a hi-fi kind of production to encase it and fully realize it. I appreciate that, man. Like that's kind of been my, you know, I've, you know, I'm like 20 plus years deep into doing this music shit. And, you know, it's like, I, I can do the most busted ass dirty shit you've ever heard, but yeah, it'll be hi-fi, so to speak. You know, it'll be yeah. like, you know, all, all frequencies are covered, you know, but it'll be the most dusted blown out, you know, or, or I can be really clean, you know, shiny stuff, you know, and it's, <laughs> I could talk all day about music production. I, I, I just, I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad. I'd like to talk a little bit about Anticon if we can, because to me, this collective was hugely important, hugely inspirational as an artist myself. And just as a listener, I was a huge fan. And, um, you know, a lot of people were like me, excited about it. A lot of people were also completely turned off. I know you were sort of divisive <laughs> and had a lot of, uh, yeah haters um in the industry and in the audiences but um it was very very unique for the time and uh i think whether people acknowledge it or not you all as a collective changed the course of of hip hop and brought hip hop to new audiences that wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to it like the indie rock art rock kind of crowds you played an important role. So I'd like to document a little bit of the Anticon history. We're not going to completely go into it, of course, but you know, over the course of this podcast, I'd like to talk to some other members and kind of document a little bit of that era. And so, you know, this will be episode one in the Anticon oral history, if you will. Okay. So we've talked about how you met Dose and Y, and then if you could talk about just from your perspective, how that led into Anticon. Well, from my understanding, uh, it was Brandon Best, uh, AKA the pedestrian and Tim Holland, AKA soul. They were the ones that came up with the term Anticon or Anticon, however you want to pronounce it. And um, it was Aaron Horky who did the, he actually was the guy that drew the, the, the ant logo. I think he went by abuse. Brandon and Tim or, or soul and pedestrian, they already had this thing and they had destructo who was the, 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 the first graphic designer for the label. And we, we all just met at scribble jam. That's really what it was. You know, scribble jam was every summer, you know, you know, Mr. Dibs and some other cats would do this thing called scribble jam where it was like, you know, like it was all, all whatever, nine elements of hip hop, you know, like everybody comes together and it's gra graph and break dancing, DJing, rapping, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, I, I went to Scribble Jam uh, and the first time I went there was 1999. And that's when I met Soul. That's when I met uh, Pedestrian. That's when I met Mayonnaise. I think I met Sage Francis. Just met all these people like Slug from Atmosphere, Idea. You know, the list goes on and on. And it just it just kind of just came together really naturally. And. Tim Holland, uh, a.k.a. Soul, he, he moved to San Francisco, I think, in the 99 or something, late 90s. And I think he was out here pretty much solo. And he linked up with, like, DJ Steph, RIP DJ Steph. And, you know, Brandon was out here, pedestrian. And they just were pushing, like, let's make this label thing happen. And they did Deep Huddle Dynamics. And when I when I first met Dose One, he was like, you need to hear this thing that we did called Deep Puddle Dynamics. And of course, I listened to it and I loved it. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Soul's idea was to start a label called Anticon to put out stuff like Deep Puddle Dynamics, 
sold Bottle of Humans, um, the first Buck 65, 12 inch, the Centaur, uh, the first Them album, which is, you know, Dose One and Gel. I did, there's some other stuff too, but yeah, I mean, it, it just, people were just doing shit, you know, like doing stuff. You're like, you have a vision, like, and, uh, I came into the picture around 2001 is when I really got linked up. Like I was already cool with those guys, but I wasn't necessarily committed. I think, I think what happened was, is that soul, I gave him a copy of plan nine, meet your hypnotist, which, which, which was my second take. I gave him a copy of that and he called me maybe like a week later and he was like, yo, like, I, I want to work with you, you, you know, like, let's get down. And I was like, cool. I mean, I'm into it, you know? And so I just kind of fell into it. I just kind of fell into Anticon. That's how I just always describe it. Like I didn't audition or, you know, I just was making music and hanging out with Adam or Dose and, and Yoni and, and, you know, the music that I was making started to spread amongst cool folks and, it all just kind of just fell into place. And well, first Anticon was going through um, TRC, a distributor who is gladly uh, now defunct. It turns out that TRC was ripping Anticon off. Um, I don't know the details and I don't really care at this point. And then it turned out that like, well, let's start our own distribution company, which right. which was six months distribution. And, and this was right when I moved to California from Cincinnati. This was like 2001. and you know, we just ran with it, you know, and six months was a low key distribution company that we ran out of Emeryville, California, which is right next to Berkeley, right next to Pixar, actually, you know, and we did our thing, you know, and, and, you know, the first album that we put out that kind of blew up was the first Sage Francis album, the personal journals. Yeah. I was the art director at the time, like, you know, so I was, I was dealing with the website. I was dealing with the Everything from like laying out a barcode to like doing a whole website to doing t-shirt designs, posters, stickers, overseeing like the screen printing of t-shirts, you know, all that stuff. That, that was like my thing. And I think everybody knew at the time that we had something special and it's like, why not take advantage of it? Because this was like right when the internet was starting to pop, you know, so you could like connect with people on the internet, you know, message boards, stuff like that. And it, it was there was a lot of money to be made back then. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really weird how you could make a lot of money back then, like selling CDs, you know, and, and I don't know what, what, what else do you want to know about? Aside from just how inventive you were and how new and fresh it was at the time, what you all were doing. What I think is interesting too, is how I mentioned before the uh, controversy that you ran into And the way that you rubbed people wrong, of course, the infamous LP and soul beef caused this rift between the two camps, Def Jux and Anticon. Then all the fans would choose their sides. For me, these were like the two pinnacles of great rap music and uh, the two would not intermingle. And um, there was just a lot of people that didn't like the fact that you guys were coming out with a certain bravado, maybe uh, calling the album music for the advancement of hip hop. And probably the fact that you all were white was not helpful. You know, so I, I wonder a couple of things. Like, I wonder, did you feel this negative energy coming towards you at the time? And how did you deal with that? And looking at that time in retrospect, do you feel like you have any regrets or new perspectives on the way that you were interacting and being seen in the larger world of hip hop? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a good, that's a good question. And I can go, I can delve really deep into it. Like my thing is like, I grew up in Kennedy Heights, Cincinnati, Ohio. And if, if anybody knows where I grew up, it's a predominantly black neighborhood. I grew up pretty much around black folks. The music that I was drawn to since the early eighties was whatever was coming off the radio. I was in the hip hops. I mean, I followed hip hop until it became a world phenomenon from when it was like barely on the radio to a worldwide phenomenon. And my thing is like, 
all that all that drama that was going on back then i i thought it was useless and i thought it was performative and <laughs> just a waste of fucking time to be honest with you and like when the first time i went to scribble jam i was amazed at how many how insecure like a lot of these midwest white dudes were were behaving and i'm not going to name names but you know, those motherfuckers know who I'm talking about. And, you know, it's like, I didn't grow up around white people. I grew up around black people. I grew up around that music. Forgive my, my, my potty mouth, but like for us to be called faggots and, you know, uh, white, white boys or like whatever the fuck people were calling us back then. And I'm not going to name any of these rappers names, but those that know, know who I'm talking about. And like, to me, it was just a, a complete waste of time. It may have helped Anticon to uh, become established, but that's one of the things that I've always hated about being a part of the scene, the so-called scene, like whether it's, we call it underground hip hop, like underground Midwestern hip hop, white hip hop, like whatever you want to fucking call it. Like, it's just, to me, it's just music. Like, I just want to snap your neck, dude. I want to make a beat. I'm going to make a beat that's going to snap your neck. And that's it. Like I, you know, or I'm going to make some ambient stuff that that's going to make you feel like you're floating on feathers. Like all this nonsense, it's, it's, it's all nonsense to me. And other members of Anticon would probably tell you otherwise, but my thing is this. Okay. So I've been on stage hundreds and hundreds of times, if not thousands of times, I've been behind the, the DJ booth and I've never once used my so-called spotlight to trash somebody else. Yet there's these rappers that are still prominent today, uh, more famous than ever. I'm not going to name any names because they know who they are, where they use their spotlight to trash us for reasons that are like still to this day. I don't understand why people trashed us. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could tell me. I mean, you could tell me, dude. I don't know, man. But like, I don't play this shit, dude. Like that shit was a waste of our time, dude. But I've never been involved in it. You know, there, there, there's been a, there's maybe been two or three times where I've like been so fed up with certain rappers that I've called them out on social media. But otherwise, like I, I, I stay away from that, dude. That shit is, <laughs> that's what little boys do. Little boys get together and they, they, they call each other faggots. Like, no, that's like, I'm, I'm a man. Like, I don't do that. I don't play that game. Like, if I don't like you, I'm just not going to listen to you. Like, if I don't like you, I'm just going to hit mute. I'm going to hang up on you. Like, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and like trash you on social media or get on stage and be like, you. sorry, I'm a little fired up when you bring that question up. because that's- <laughs> I, I get it. It is a very unfortunate part of hip hop, the drama and the combative nature and the sort of like gang mentalities that people have. I think it seems to have led up to some degree since those days. And there seems to be more room for experimentation and being a little more free you know you can wear a silly costume without being called gay for it for example um but uh yeah at the time i experienced it myself out in hawaii i was wearing silly costumes rapping and people just hated me for it but of course you were just there making beats you know you weren't on the mic like talking shit but i think that there was a certain element in some of the interviews and lyrics where certain MCs were kind of talking a lot of shit with a sort of condescending attitude you know you're all like kind of newcomers and i think people took it as like as like a triple whammy like they look different they sound different and they're being pompous too how do you think we we were being pompous I, I, that's what i've always been baffled by like what what did we do that was so pompous well first of all that's like also a tradition in hip-hop to say i am the best you know and i really thought about this as a topic because i heard soul talking about it more recently about feeling a bit of regret for coming out with this this album titled the music for the advancement of hip-hop presenting yourselves as being so much better than the rest of this culture that you were running counter to in a lot of ways and 
Yeah, I don't want to be insulting, but yeah, I do think there was a certain bravado. Just be honest, dude, please. I would say dose and soul, especially, you know, they're like the battle rapper dudes that were like just dissing people yeah. constantly, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, I guess so was everyone else because that's like the culture of hip hop, but they just stuck out like sore thumbs because the music was so different. The look was so different, you know, soul with his long hair, dose wearing like you know, weird clothes or whatever. <laughs> dude, you're so right, dude. You totally, you, 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 you get it, dude. You're totally right, dude. I mean, that's just, I, I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I've been through so much with both uh, Dose and Soul, like, you know, touring and, and just being together, being very intimate with music. You know, like when you work with people, when you collaborate, it's a very intimate process, right? And you're really in tune with somebody and, you know, and, and that's where I think the magic of early Anticon was happening was like we we would get together and we inspired each other and magical things happen, I guess, you know, and, and I, I don't I still to this day don't understand. I mean, I get it from from your perspective as far as like soul and dose one standing out because they were the two pillars, yeah. you know, I mean. Uh, if you if you were to talk to like gel, you know, like he'd say the same thing, like they were the two pillars of Anticon and in many ways, both business wise and artistically, they were the pillars, you know, and, and they had a lot to say and, you know, they still have a lot to say and, and it backfired in a lot of ways, but it also helped spark, you know, this thing that we were able to able to build upon, you know, and, and a lot of people believed in us and a lot of people still believe in us, which I think is a beautiful thing. But, you know, for me, it was always about the art, like always about the art. Like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to offend nobody, dude. Like, I, I mean, but I know that I do. Like, I know that I've done, you know, the, the very first beat battle I did. <laughs> this is a tangent, but the very first beat battle I did was like in, I don't know, 2008, way, way back in the day. And it was in San Francisco and I was battling this guy who went by Beethoven. <laughs> and he was like a, he was like this hot producer in San Francisco and I showed up with like a bushy beard and like my hair was all messed up and like I was wearing a, a flannel that had like holes in it and he played his track and everybody got all hyped it was all like symphonic like this is like pre uh, uh hyphy it was like kind of like on the verge of like when hyphy started to blow up in the bay area <laughs> and like I yeah. played this like stupid ass drum break with all these machine gun sounds it was like just a drum break with all these machine gun sounds and i just sat there standing in front of him like holding like a you know like an imaginary machine gun and was just shooting him the whole time and, and i'm like this like could i be more of a fucking white guy like you know but yeah like i, I well you guys were all young you know and you're full of <laughs> full of piss and vinegar and and i was right there with you out on out on the islands, just just trying to get a rise out of people. But um, I maintain that it was a, a beautiful era, and I thank you for being a part of it. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you about, another group that was kind of peripheral to Anticon was sh the Shapeshifters. And I know that you were producing the Circus for Dictator LP, yeah. which, which unfortunately never came out. But you did release the five track EP Zombie Burger. And for people that don't know, this is uh, Circus was one of the members of Shapeshifters and just a very, I don't know, how can you describe Circus? <laughs> uh, brilliant, uh, incredible artist, uh, funny yes. as hell. Like, he's like, yeah, he's like the, he's the big homie. But, you know, like I, I only got to spend so much time with him, you know, you know, like me being in the Bay Area and him, you know, he's in LA and, I remember the first time I heard Circus was Dose One had all these dub tapes. He had like a nice collection of just tapes of all this underground hip hop that I was not familiar with. And he played me this like these like early versions of what became like those really dense shapeshifter tracks. Yeah. Um, like double, double CD shapeshifter tracks. Like Adam had like early, like, I mean, I don't want to call them demos, but like, I guess they were demos, whatever. But it was like just circus and just ripping over these like dope beats. Scum and villainy. Sorry, I have no name. Is my only claim to fame is an ever changing shape. Takes the form of a rhyme. Word is born on the earth realm. We learn beneath the place. Exists a timeless life that has no price. And at times the cycle can get hectic. That's why I remain a 
and I just was like, who the fuck is this guy, man? Like, and then, you know, I eventually met Circus and we hit it off right away. And he liked my music. And of course I, I loved his, you know, his approach to MC and his humor is he's, he's, he's very creative, like visually very talented. And um, him and I, at some point we just were like, yo, let's do an album together. And we maybe did like six or seven tracks and then it just fell apart. Like any other project, you know, it's like you, you set out to do something and you're all like psyched about it. And it's just, you know, logistics get in the way and, you know, life gets in the way and, you know, it just, it just didn't come together, but I released, like you said, the, I think I put out the, the version with the vocals on it. I also put out the version with just the instrumentals as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool stuff, man. It's, you know, I don't know. It makes me laugh. Yeah, it's great. It's always good to have a good laugh. You know? <laughs> He's an interesting guy, dude, for sure. Yes. It's a it's a goal to get him on the podcast someday. If we can track him down, we'll see. Yeah. You recently put out the album External Magnetic with Tokyo Cigar, and um, I was really surprised to see the two of you working together. I didn't realize you knew each other, and I had recently became acquainted with Tokyo about a year ago or so. He's been on our Weird Rap discussion gang and stuff, and uh, so I was wondering how that came together and what you can say about that project. Well, um, one day I was on Facebook and I saw a, a post by a weird rap. Oh, <laughs> and it was, you know, and like, you were like, yo, check out Tokyo cigar. And, and I, I listened to, I think the song's called 1988. 1986. And I was like, dude, like that, that, that's the most fucking weird ass beat I've ever heard. And the way he flows over that, yeah, and then the the video, like the just the way that he the, he did the video, and I was like, this man, this guy is like, he's on some shit. Miami FBI, they got shot. Microsoft stock on trading block. Black Sea incident pop. Sit and watch. DEA hitting spots, taking crops. Magistrate talks, future shots. Stop Yemen sipping war blast. And I just hit him up, you know, just the same way that I pretty much been doing my whole life with people I just hit him up and see you know see what's going on and he was like down to to work with me and so i made that project come together that's amazing i had no idea i had no idea about tokyo cigar until you posted about him and you know like i i try to follow people like yourself and other writers and artists that i think are you know, worth following, you know, it gets, it gets a little daunting at, at times where you're just like, I can't, can't pay attention to everything, but yeah, like people like you, like I follow you and I see the stuff that you post and I'm like, I, you know, I, I trust that you're not going to bullshit me. And, but yeah, I mean like Tokyo cigar, I was like, I was so inspired. I was like, wow. Like, this is like, I was almost like, a, you know, like nervous to even contact him. I was like, you know, this guy probably doesn't want to fuck with me. And he was like super receptive and very open. And I was like, check this beat out. And he would just send me the shit back, like really well recorded, fully mixed. All I had to do was just blend my beat into with, with, with his vocals. And it's like, boom, you, you got it, dude. Like if you were to talk to Tokyo, I, I, I think you would say the same thing. Like it was pretty fucking obvious from the jump that like him and I could, you know, work together. And I just kept floating them beats like, yo, yo, here's, Check this beat out. What do you think about this beat? And then he would send me shit back within two days and it'd be awesome. I put the album together really quick, you know, which yeah. there's something about being spontaneous that I'm really into. And I think that album, it has a very spontaneous feel to it. It's very like in your face. Like there's certain points where the bass is just like blowing your fucking head off, you know? And like, if you got nice speakers, Trust me, like that album on nice speakers will blow your head off. He tossed the powder out the hand, Bolo versus Van Dam, Red Trans Am, Bank Scams, and then he met up with his man's Pride Jams, the size of his plans, Rodan, Bobby Slam, needed cash in the head. Dangerous, like And, you know, he's got all these like rich, detailed 
raps about like you know like very visual you know and these like what i think are pretty hard ass beats you know and it is what it is yeah he gets really loose vocally on that like you know i was already a fan of him but i feel like he really got extra wild over your beats so highly recommend that you know one other thing i wanted to talk to you about is the other recent release i was going to recommend on this episode was the new serengeti album and I know you did a lot of work with him. I was trying to interview him, but the dude is oddly like hesitant to uh, do interviews and stuff. Yeah. I love him. He's one of my favorite artists, but he's very mysterious in the way he operates. So I uh, just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what your experience was like working with Serengeti. Working with Dave, working with Getty, man. Always, always laughing, I guess is like the first thing I would think of. We always would laugh. I remember, <laughs> so so Getty would come out to Berkeley and he would stay in this, you know, these hotels, you know, and we we would work in the cottage, like all the all the Getty stuff that Jeff and I produced, Jell and I produced, um, it was all done here in the in my cottage, and Getty would be in this hotel and like he just would always be cracking jokes and like one day him and I were like went for a walk, like I was like, hey, uh, let, let's go for a walk around West Berkeley and I'll show you how beautiful it is here. And he was like, yo, I really want to do a Shaq diss song. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? You, you, want, to, you want to do a Shaq? A, you, you, you want to diss Shaq on record? He's like, yeah, yeah. I want to do a Shaq diss song. And we went for a walk and he was just like ripping. And it was so funny. We came back to the cottage and I was like, yo, check out this beat that's been laying around for years. Like this old SB 1200 beat, <laughs> which, and then he just started ripping. And like, it was like one take. And we had the, sh- you know, the, the, the Shaq this song, I can't remember the name of it, that's the Shazam. <laughs> it was so in the moment, just so like inspired, like you know, it's sunny out, it's warm. I, I'm in West Berkeley, I'm walking around with no stone and like he's showing me shit and I want to dish Shaquille O'Neal and <laughs> we go back to my place. I play him a beat and he just one take, just rip Shaq. It was so funny. He's like one of those dudes, like, you, you know, you hang out with them and like, you're always laughing, you know, like you just can't stop laughing. And he, he makes you step your game up. I think Getty always brings out the best in me as far as like, my particular style of like hip hop production, you know, I think you can hear that in those the albums that we did. You know, we did a lot of stuff together, you know, I don't know, yeah. four albums and one EP. I, I did so much stuff, man. And it's just, it's all, to me, it's all really solid and well thought out, but also very loose and spontaneous and just inspired, you know, like he's a very creative, sensitive unique artist you know and and i totally understand why he's very private i'm the same way like i mean this is only the i think the third interview that i've done like that's you know not on paper you know where i'm actually you know you can hear me talk oh you know and it's like it's it's tough to be that it's tough to do that shit dude like yeah i mean to me everything is creative like everything i do is creative like there's nothing i mean anybody that knows me intimately or, or or at least personally knows that that about me like everything is creative everything every move i make there's like a creative spark behind it yeah that's it's admirable have you put out uh any solo work recently you want to talk about or anything that's on the horizon i think some of my most favorite stuff that i've done lately is it's called flippies i don't know if you heard yeah it. yeah yeah so flippies Flippies was like a joke um, between me and my girlfriend, like two and a half, three years ago, I just was writing just stupid words and I wrote flippies and I was working on what became the very first flippies. And my girlfriend was like looking at my notepad and she was like, what the, what is flippies? <laughs> and I was like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? What is flippies? I don't know what it is. And then <laughs> I was like, yo, flippies. And then I just cranked out like all this, you know, Flippy's best tape, Flippy's shit tape. That's 
some of the more recent stuff that I've put out. I also put out a thing called Home, like a little, um, just like a B tape. Uh huh. But what I'm really excited about is um, I'm, there's four there's four songs that I'm working with um, that I'm almost done with with uh, Marcus Ocker from The No Twist. Cool. Yeah, they're, they're they're very close to being finished, and it'll that stuff will come out on vinyl. You know, it'll be well promoted. And there's also two remixes that I did for The No Twist most recent album um vertigo days which is going to come out on 10 inch awesome no i'm just doing my thing dude you know i just i try to spend as much time with my 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 loved one as i can and and get through this pandemic bullshit yeah it is what it is you know like i got remixes that are slowly creeping out there like like i just i like things that just kind of just be out there like i don't i know some people would frown on me for this but like I don't care about all the promotion. Like, I don't need a publicist. I don't want that stuff. Like, I don't want to have to answer emails and, you know, I'm down to talk to you. Or, like, I'm down to, like, respond to people on Twitter and Facebook. But, you know, it's just, there's the music. If you want it, you can go find it. Otherwise, like, I'm not trying to, like, break my back to get this music out to you. Because I make the music for myself. I do it for myself. I feel fortunate that there are, that there are people out there that are willing to check out my music and act, and actually pay for it. Like there's people that actually buy my music and that's like, that, that it's a beautiful thing. You know, it's like my, all this work and labor that I put into it, all the money that I spend to like, you know, buy equipment, you know, buying records all the time and effort to think that it pays off is it's a beautiful thing, you know? And, and if you don't like it, you don't like it. If you like it. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think it is quite a blessing that you're able to sustain yourself without having to go the route of constantly self-promoting and trying to break through the static like so many other people do. And I think that probably speaks to how unique your music really is. It's not like there's a dozen other odd no-stoms that people can turn to. Thank you. You got a David Liebehart song coming out soon as well. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, that's it's. I I actually really like the like you 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 kind of flip parts of the end of it, right? I mean, you, yeah, you, you kind of chop it up a little bit. Yeah, I, that's I, all I, good, man. I'm I'm super down. I mean, I no worries, dude. Like, you know, like David Liebhardt. I'm a huge Tim and Eric fan, so you know, it's really cool. Um, How did you link with uh with with David Liebhardt? I was interviewing him actually for my radio. I used to do a radio show back in like 2012 or 13. It must have been 2013 or 14 or something. I was interviewing him for a radio show. He had my phone number. He kept calling me back, like just, just like hassling me, asking me for, you know, <laughs> asking me to look things up on the internet for him, doing little favors here and there. It was just the weirdest dude I've ever met by far, but um, I love how unique he is, and uh, it's it's always just a, an adventure working with him. But uh, yeah, I just want to thank you again for your time, man. It's a pleasure. I know you, yeah, you're not about the self promo, but what's the best way for people to keep track of you and hear your music? Uh, no stom Bandcamp, no stom Twitter, no stom Facebook. You know, you can just Google the shit, you know, it'll, it'll all come up, you know. It's, yeah. There's no other no stum. All right. Thank you, buddy. I'll talk to you later. Peace. All right. So that was my conversation with, uh, odd no stum. What'd you think, Zach? I liked it. For me, it was exciting to hear about the genesis of Anticon. To me, it was like a mythical crew. I didn't know. I didn't know what any of them looked like. I didn't know whose voice was who necessarily. And like kind of assumed they were all close friends and like they were, you know, just kind of coming from the same area. So it took me a while to figure out the makeup of that collective. And then I think it was also really nice that, that he kind of laid out like how this kind of came together. Um, who was, who were the leaders, who were the key figures and how he fit into that. Yeah. Like I said, they were hugely inspirational for me and just kind of flipped my whole understanding of what hip hop could be. So, um, yeah, I definitely want to keep documenting that era and those artists. So hopefully, you know, we can get some more of them on the show at some point. Yeah. I also liked like the spirit of collaboration that he talked about and how it seemed 
like a natural thing for him to work with other artists and reach out to them. And it seemed like the way those things happened seemed pretty organic. Like with this one, I think was spawned from a tweet and he said that he's just kind of reached out to other people that he liked. Yeah, it seemed like a lot of his work comes together kind of organically, like you said, including like the Glass Cutters project, which is actually part of the uh, the Patreon bonus. If anyone wants to hear a little bit more of my talk with No Stom, uh, we talk about the Glass Cutters album with Gel, and we get into some kind of awkward territory. Figured I'd leave that uh, that spicy material for the patrons, and then we're gonna get into. Your interview, Zach, Beverly Fresh, as he's known, is going to talk to Illogic, which was a great conversation. He gets into the uh, Columbus, Ohio hip-hop scene in the mid-90s and stuff, and um, also talks about how he met Dosen Y of Green Think, and that part is going to be in the Patreon bonus as well. But up next, we're going to get into the interview at the point where Zach is asking about the general approach that Illogic took to this project and where he was coming from lyrically. Anything else you want to preface this uh, interview with, Zach? Uh, no, I'll just say that um, I got to hear some new material beyond what's on the EP, um, things that he's experimenting with, and I was super excited by it to, to hear him kind of take a new vocal direction, new sense of musicality. Um, that he's tinkering around with. So, like, yeah, I'm super excited for whatever he does next. So, look out for that. Oh, yeah. Well, that reminds me of they also sent us um, a bonus track, which will also be in the Patreon from the Write the Ship EP sessions. And, like Nosedom said, he didn't have a chance to master everything because he lost his studio or whatever. But I thought it was a great track. And, and like you're saying, the logic is trying some new directions. It seems like that's an example of of that you know he's he's like basically singing on this track yeah yeah i agree i think i think it's a great track i love the beat and then yeah what he's doing with his vocals i think there's some really good poetic lines on there and then also this like a blues quality where it's kind of this eternal theme um the simple refrain that's like simple yet profound so yeah i'm I'm really into it so yeah check that out and, and subscribe to the patreon Patreon.com slash weird rap. At the time. At the time. At the time. At the, at the time. 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 At the time, um, I was going through things with friends, close friends, and, you know, kind of losing close friends and, you know, dealing with different personalities at work and just having a whole lot of um, um, challenges in relationships that I was in. And, you know, that's where a lot of that push and pull um, kind of, you know, ideas in a lot of those songs, because most of those songs I actually wrote in the parking lot of work during lunchtime, (laughs) you know, so, um, you know, kind of being in that, you know, that um, atmosphere, you know, in that environment around people that, I know sometimes are probably being fake to me, you know, around people that, you know, I consider friends in some ways and other ways. I'd have no idea who they are. Um, Then on top of, you know, my actual friends and actual associates outside of work. Um, So, you know, um, Nose Down would send me beats and usually I would just uh, write you know, to those beats. Yeah. I I love hearing insight into your writing process. And, um, yeah, because I was trying to figure out like who, who is it that you're addressing like throughout the record? you know, I'm like, Mm -hmm. it could be, it could be America. It could be just, you know, society in general right now. It could be, you know, a partner. It could be an older version of himself. It could be a friend, Mm -hmm. you know, and then like maybe it's all these things all at once. Exactly. It is. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I loved I love that is like seems like you're you were in this very specific mind state. And then that, you know, made this really cohesive approach to writing lyrics. And I think that comes out like in this uh, in the first the title track, Write the Ship. 
Mm-hmm. To me, it sounds like, you know, there's a crew and there's one person within that crew and you're trying to negotiate and mm-hmm. get things on course. And, you know, that could be, a, you know, a metaphor for where our society's going or a relationship that you're in. And, you know, I think there's two things that stand out, these attempts that are discarded that you discover. Like the first one is survival and then the next one is growth. Mm-hmm. Um and you, you see them that, that they're failed attempts and you ultimately offer them at the end of the song, now watch this. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering like, you know, what is, what is this? Like, I think it could be, you know, like a, like a Zen poem, you know, like kind of just this open-ended question. Well, it's, you know, in the world that I see, in the world that I want as a human being, um, I'm all about being an example and hopefully I am being an example in some way of, you know, how to live a life, how to be a human being, how to be a rapper, how to, you know, kind of move with honor and dignity in this hip hop game without having to sell your soul or, you know, kind of more being who you are and growing as the person that you're meant to be and sticking to those principles as opposed to trying to be something that you're not. Um, so the song Right the Ship, that song is more talking about music um, at its core, but a lot of the concepts and a lot of the um, the topics in the song can be related to societal um, issues as well. And where do you think that drive comes from, like for you to, you know, to lead by example? Did you have a mentor or somebody in your life that that did that for you and now you're kind of giving back or where? Where does that inspiration come from? Um, honestly, it, I, I believe it, it. it's just something that's been ingrained in me watching my grandmother as a leader. Um, she was, you know, a minister and a community leader. Um, my mother um, as well was, you know, a very conscious and involved community person, um, you know, coming up in high school, she, you know, did sit-ins and, you know, marches and organized boycotts and things like that when she was in high school. Um, and my mother always taught me coming up that, you know, you can't expect people to do things that you wouldn't do yourself. So being an example has always been the thing, like, if I can do it, then you have no excuse, you know, because if I can do it, you can do it, you know. So without asking people to do something that I wouldn't do, you know, I'd rather just kind of walk the walk and let that speak for me as opposed to, you know, standing on some pedestal, you know, trying to preach to people and bark to people about things that I would never even try to accomplish myself. How do you feel about the the state of hip hop or there's like the music industry at large? Like if this if this right the ship track is addressing that and you've been, you know, a couple decades in, in the music industry, um mm-hmm. what are your feelings about it now? Um, I mean, they're mixed. You know, um, I think the cool thing about it is that there's so much variety, you know, so there's so many things that like there's certain types of music, you know, certain types of hip hop that you just don't have to listen to if you don't like it. You know, you have the option to especially with um, television, not really having video shows and things like that. Everything is, you know, everything is a la carte now. You know, you can kind of pick and choose the artists that you like. You can pick and choose specific songs off albums. If you don't like full albums, you can pick and choose, you know, genres of hip hop that, you know, you like. So I love that aspect of it. Um, But the popularity, you know, the popularity of the drug, you know, the guns, the um, over sexualizing women, the the popularity of that is heartbreaking. And I believe that that has a big effect on society as a whole because hip hop is the most popular musical genre in the world. Um, the fact that that's the kind of messages that are being driven and embedded into the minds of mostly children that listen to this stuff that are, you know, totally 
um, influenced by that and don't have the discernment to understand that most of these cats are just making up stories as opposed to this being real life and that, you know, that kind of stuff is not the way that a human is supposed to operate. Um, I believe that that is a problem. But, you know, about the industry in general, I think the fact that you have artists like me and artists like, you know, um, that you have independence, you know, that independence is possible. I think that is an amazing, an amazing thing. And we've never been in a time where there's more diversity in hip hop ever. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the a la carte era like sums it up and it's a good, yeah. good way to put it. The next track you have is handwriting. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, you have the, seems like the concept of school or these references to, you know, the, the handwriting, the, the last line I think is no wonder you couldn't pass. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the spirit of like this playground cat and mouse game almost like throughout the track. Um, and I was thinking it's like an intimate, but also frank conversation with the subject. Um, and it seems like as the author, it seems like you're speaking to somebody you have a long history with of like, Mm -hmm. you know, ups and downs. Um, it's been a struggle just to befriend you, um, with all these warheads locked and loaded. And it, it seems like maybe, and I could be wrong, but I read it as toggling between a conversation with a, a lifelong friend or partner and then with America and maybe American ideals. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, and I liked also that there, it was to me open-ended that there wasn't like this, um, like common, I used to love her. There's this like, you know, the big reveal at the end and it's like, <laughs> I gotcha. You know, uh-huh. this is like, I like that there's room for it to breathe. And, um, I think, you know, I can find evidence in the work that there, you're kind of holding these two, um, the conversation with the partner and the conversation with your country at the same time and Mm -hmm. kind of having this fluid dialogue between the two. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the background of this track handwriting? Um, well, this track was, um, specifically, um, initially addressing a close friend of mine that I kind of fell out with. Um, and it was someone that I was super close with, but, um, due to, you know, life and just differences in growing up, um, you know, we kind of had our issues and, um, but also like you were saying is more of a broad social, um, theme as well, talking to, you know, my community, talking to the history of, you know, who we used to be as a community and more speaking um, in the close knit, you know, community of African-Americans and inner city um, communities kind of looking back like, you know, we used to be so close. We used to do all of these things together and now we're bickering and we're fighting and we're kind of at each other's throats and there's really no reason for it, but we understand that it kind of, we kind of have to go through these growing pains. And the reason that it's open-ended is because the story isn't over yet. You know, society is still evolving. Society can still grow and can still achieve, you know, peace and achieve greatness in itself, if it chooses to, you know, so there's never really an end to it, you know, to the story until, you know, there's an end to this world. So, um, you know, you, you did catch, catch everything that, you know, was meant to, to, um, be talked about with that. It is very open-ended and, um, I think it's open-ended with me and my friend as well. You know, like we still communicate with each other and have gotten a little more closer over the years. Um, but at that time, you know, there was, there was some issues. Yeah, no, I can see that. And and it, it seems like the track has this, you know, in some ways that's heartbreaking. It has this, this tone of sadness, but then there's still hope within it. You know, I think, and like you said, the, it's not over yet. There's still a possibility for it to get worse or <laughs> to get better, hopefully. All right. Uh, while noticing that you haven't changed a bit and don't intend to been a struggle to just befriend you with all these warheads locked and loaded in hopes no one closes in on your flaws for many days i've marched around your barricade seven times every seventh day with trumpets blaring waiting for the walls to fall now i'm swimming in your shadow fighting for a little piece of light is such a battle i know there's gotta be a better the next track is chokehold um and the line that, that stuck out to me is we've all 
been on the side of a chokehold with no prep. And mm. it just like, I don't know. I mean, I've had some, you know, like routine violence, some m more life threatening violence uh, in my life. And it's just like reminding me of that. Like you get hit or somebody does something to you and it just like that immediate shock of, like before the pain sets in, you know, mm -hmm. and you're just like, I didn't know, I didn't see that coming or I didn't know this person was capable of this or like, I, you know, I just wasn't ready. And your world is just kind of does a 360 and you're, you know, in your brain, you're trying to, you know, orientate yourself and you know, the pain's coming and it's just like, <laughs> it's about to take hold. And that moment of just panic and, and confusion is like what that line conjures up um, to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that, again, I mean, it could be personal. It could be about your community. It could be about America. Um, I like that, again, that it's like it's not specific, um, you know, specific in what it conjures up in terms of emotion, but it could be mm -hmm. put into different contexts and, and, and work very well. Yeah. With, with, well, chokehold was one of those, um, it was more of an experiment. Um, it was kind of where the music took me as far as the writing and as far as the structure of the song outside of, you know, just the lyrics themselves. Um, and really doing something, really being inspired to do something outside of the box, which also lent itself to the concept of the song and kind of not being like, pin down to a specific thing you know like it starts out you know many a days that i cried uh, many a hopes that i've laid to rest although many a times that i've tried many a moves that i don't regret i guess everything that i see everything that i touch the way belongs to me being in the mass that takes trust i'm gonna shine despite rust the green and disagree nothing is ever denied if you're pushing the front lost and fall and re-us when you get up we all keep moving in spite There's this thing, this inner thing um, with us as human beings where, you know, we need to cry. We need to go through tri triumph and we need to go through tragedy in order to become the people that we're supposed to be and become the people that we're meant to be in this life. If everything was given to us and everything was, you know, all flowers and rainbows, we would never really appreciate it because we would never know the other side of that coin. We have to, you know, really understand and know in life that there's going to be those ups and downs. There's going to be that roller coaster and it, you know, going through those things teaches us how to appreciate the chokehold, you know, because we, we appreciate the breath that we get when that chokehold is no longer there and it's not surprising us and not being jarring to us. You know, that that's really that inner, you know, struggle that um, we have as human beings of learning how to appreciate the struggle, um, but not wallow in it. You know, look for look for the the, um, you know, the good stuff without wallowing in the bad, but understanding the bad is necessary to understand the good and appreciate the good. Yeah. I like that. And I guess also not letting the bad define you, you know, I think right. sometimes we can get, you know, by trauma or tragedy and we can, that becomes part of our identity that we can't shake. Mm. Um, so yeah, I like that, that the sentiment of kind of leaning into the hard times and embracing them and as a learning experience, I think, leads us into the the final track traffic jam mm -hmm. um where it seems like in other tracks you kind of have this this dialogue and here you're kind of implicating yourself in this scenario so you're you're stuck in traffic mm -hmm. with everybody else and you talk about the news headlines sifting through the, the headlines of today the tsunamis look so beautiful in the nighttime glow and i, I love that line and like again like you're implicating yourself and like i thought like is he is does he have this distance from it and, and can recognize that while this is a natural disaster, it could look, you know, visually beautiful mm -hmm. or, um, you know, is it talking about like the blindness of society that just like don't recognize the tragedy of what's happening because it's it's not near them. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, I, I, I like the, the ambiguity and the open endedness of that. And 
again, you kind of implicate yourself with uh, now we remember our Facebook passwords, but can't recall the details of our first kiss. And that's one I've been, you know, I've had in my head, you know, a lot. And just like, why, why do I remember this over that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, I right. Mean, that's like, oh man, that that can really mess you up. Um, mm-hmm. And and you know, and then you kind of realize how, at least I've been realizing after I heard this line of like, how much uh, I'm not in control of my thoughts most of the time, mm-hmm. um, or of what sticks. And it kind of all culminates into, I think, one of the the last lines is, I still don't know what to say, which is a very unusual thing for, you know, an <laughs> MC to confess. Uh-huh. Um, and I thought that was that was amazing. And you wonder why no one's respecting you. I still don't know what to say, but I know the games we play for amusement underscoring the useless. You know where the truth is. You know where the truth is. It's it's really a stream of consciousness piece. Um, it, it originally was a poem that I wrote without a beat, um, and um, when I this was the first song that I recorded for the project, um, and when I got the beat from Nostam, um, I was listening to the beats and actually doing some work on the the piece and just kind of it just happened you know what I mean it was just like I was working on the piece and he sent me beats and I'm just playing the beats while I'm working on this piece and you know then it just kind of morphed into like oh let me try this you know to this um and it just worked out um but the concepts in that you know song are because it's stream of consciousness it's talking about you know, the kind of things that we do think about when we're in a traffic jam, our minds kind of go everywhere because, you know, we're thinking about, oh, I hope this car doesn't hit me. Oh, I got to get home and cook this. Oh, I got to pick my son up from this. I got to, you know, we're thinking about all of the things that we've done in our day or that we still have to do. Um, And so that's why, even though the thoughts are pretty cohesive, it's still kind of scattered in the concepts of, you know, the lines because they're kind of, you know, separate entities and um the light about the facebook passwords and it's you know it's one of those things where we have to start to train ourselves in the things that we deem important enough to commit to memory um and you know it just so happens that because we're on facebook all day because we're on you know, our social media platforms all day because we're on, you know, like we don't even remember phone numbers anymore. We don't remember like the only phone numbers I remember is my wife's and my mom's and my own. I don't even know my children's phone numbers right now, (laughs) you know? Um, So the things that we commit to memory are super important. And I, you know, the funny thing is I, I wrote that line because I was actually thinking about if I remembered what my first kiss felt like. And I couldn't remember. Like, I remember the person. I remember where I was, but I don't remember the emotional thing of it. And that's a pretty important thing in our lives. The first time we kiss, you know, someone and we have those butterflies and I didn't remember that feeling. But I can sign into Twitter and Facebook and, you know, all off the top of my head. And I just kind of thought that was an I- ironical, you know, um kind of piece is that, you know, the things that we choose to commit to memory, you know, that we deem are important, you know, are are sometimes, a lot of times not, you know, shouldn't be the things that we deem important. Yeah, it's one of those lines that just kind of puts you in check, you know, puts everything <laughs> in, in perspective because like, you know, I took it at face value and I was like, okay, um, you know, I, I did the exercise myself and I found, you know, I, I landed in the same place you did. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, I was disappointed by it. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> it's one of those things like I got to get this shit together, you know? Right. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, like you're saying, you need to be more deliberate with how, how you're forming those memories. And it's interesting to hear that this is the, the first track you did. I was looking at, at the, the track listing and seeing like it's, kind of bookended by these uh, metaphors with, you know, um, something being off course and like the destinations mm-hmm. kind of stunted. So in, in the first place we need to write the ship, it's about to go off course, but let's, let's get things back on track. And then at the end we're, we're idle. We were going somewhere and now 
now we're stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought maybe the remix conceptually is a nice way to, to end it because you kind of go back and get a chance, you know, do it over again and get it right. But I think you, you, you kind of end it with this offering of, you know, what the truth is, is, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of a a mantra that's repeated, you know, that's, it seems to me like a a really significant line. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, I think that we all have our own personal truths and recognizing those and understanding those and living in those are the things that we actually strive for as human beings on a daily basis. And, you know, Things that are, quote unquote, bad um, that happen to us or that we see or that we deal with, we under we have to understand that those things are going to happen. But we all know who we are and we all know, you know, where our lives are supposed to lead us. And the thing is, like some people don't. Some people are still learning those things. As a teenager, I didn't know exactly who I was supposed to be. I just knew what my foundation was and the direction that my parents pointed me in. And I was eager enough to gather knowledge and learn so I could start to point myself in my own direction. So, you know, I think we've lived, you know, people who have lived enough life know what the truth is, know what their truth is, even though sometimes they try to run from it, even though it may not be something that you want to embrace right away because you would rather be doing this, but you're supposed to be doing this other thing over here that you really don't like. And that's one of the things that we as human beings have to start to embrace is that as long as we're walking in our purpose, we'll be prosperous. We may not always like it. It may not always be fun. It may not always feel like this is what I want to do. But most of the time you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and what you're meant to be doing. And that's when you really, you know, crack the code and feel the success. You know, when you start to embrace those things that you know that you're supposed to be doing, even if you don't like them. Yeah, that's great. That's really well put. Thanks, so um, with with that in mind, I mean, you've been making music and performing, recording for over 20 years. Yeah. Um, what is it that drives you to, to keep creating? Just living, man. Um, I don't know if I would still be sane if I didn't have the outlet of music. Um, because, you know, just living gives me so much material. You know, as I live a new day, I have a new topic to write about, you know, as, you know, society continues to develop and change and grow and, you know, I have a new topic. Like, so, you know, I I have to get these things out of me. And also, you know, I write for me first, usually. So most of my writing is in some ways therapeutic, um, in some ways kind of allowing me to understand, you know, and put my thoughts in uh, a way that I personally can understand what's going through my mind because a lot of times, you know, like the kind of person that I am, my mind races all the time. I'm always thinking of, you know, all the million things that I have to do throughout a day or the million things that I want to do um, with my music or the things that I have to do with my children or, you know, things like that. Um, and a lot of times when I do write things down, it gives me, that time to focus on something and really kind of understand, you know, myself a little more. You know, I think the more that I write and the more music that I put out, um, I understand my own way of thinking a little more. And my wife always says that, you know, the way that she knows how I'm feeling and what I'm thinking is that she finds my notebooks and she reads what I, what I've written for the last, you know, couple months. And then she knows where I'm at, you know, and, you know, and that happens for me personally, because a lot of times I don't completely understand my writing until after I'm finished with it. I don't completely understand a song until maybe after I listen to it about 30 times and it's like, oh, okay, because I don't believe that I'm always, you know, cognitively in control of what comes out of me, you know, so a lot of times I'm teaching myself and I'm learning how to cope with things myself before it even reaches the audience. Right. Is there, um, you know, thinking about that ongoing growth and development, is there something right now that you're 
specifically trying to focus on and this is like where you you can nerd out as much as you want like if it's something super (laughs) technical or you know something conceptual or whatever it is um i'm always curious to know about like somebody that's you know been doing this for so long there's still things that that bother you or something that you need you're trying to get better at or you're trying Mm -hmm. to something new you're trying to bring into your you know your working methodology um yeah we'd love to hear about that um, well, I am and have been um, working on a book, um, working on my first book. Now, it's not going to be um, I have a nonfiction thing that I've been working on for like ever. And I'm, I'm I kind of given up on it and I probably need to revisit it. But I'm going to be working on some things to kind of start to chronicle my career um, because I a lot of people don't know my story. So um, I am in the process of kind of curating um, a book to where I utilize my songs to tell the story of my life. And it's very difficult because just, you know, writing poems and writing songs are completely different than writing a book. Uh, so having to switch my mind to that is um, become, you know, kind of a challenge. You know, and I'm just honestly trying to get back into instruments. Um, I used to play the saxophone as um, as a teenager in middle school and high school. Um, so I want to relearn the saxophone. I haven't really gotten, you know, played it in a long time. So I'm sure once I pick it up and get a few lessons, like it'll, it should, the muscle memory should come back. Um, Cause I used to be very good at it, uh, but I just kind of, I think my saxophone broke in high school and I never got it fixed. And, you know, that and that just, you know, that's how it happened. Um, so I really want to dive back into, you know, instruments and learning some some instruments and getting my saxophone playing back, starting to learn drums. You know, I want to do things like that um, going forward. So, you know, I think that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just learning that's you know <laughs> yeah I think that's a lot like just learning and writing but also continuing to expand style wise and you know even maybe bend some genres um, coming here you know um, in the future you know I've been doing some different things with my voice and kind of learning my voice a little more as we talked about earlier and um, you know really trying to use it in different ways um, I've I've started to look at songwriting and you can kind of see that in autopilot um, a little more. Um, I've started to look at songwriting as not being limited anymore. Um, Song structure, the way that songs are built, the way that music is, you know, built around words. I'm starting to see that now that I'm a producer, I have so much more control over everything, (laughs) You know, so I've I've been working on, um, I mean, I have like three or four different projects that I'm working on um, and all of them are different. I have a few um, instrumental pieces that I'm working on. Um, I have kind of a bluesy, sing-songy thing that I'm working on where I got like pieces of songs that are done and ideas um, that are completely you know, out of left field, you know, as far as what people are used to. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm just working on all these different things because as a producer, I'm starting to find out that because I listen to so much music and my palette is so vast, as far as the type of music that I listen to, I'm starting to make all the different types of music that I listen to. So it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to come from me over the the next few years. And um, I awesome. hope you guys are ready for the ride. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I'm really excited about the blues project you mentioned. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Really interesting. Maybe I'll, um, I'll send you a sneak peek of something after we get off. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh, man. That sounds so good. I'm into that. Um, yeah, last thing I wanted to touch on was, um, the super duty, tough work podcast you're doing with blueprint. Yeah. Um, if you could talk about your role in that or how that came to be, what your, what your motivation for that project is. Um, well, um, me and blueprint, I mean, we, he's basically like a big brother to me. I mean, we've known each other for, you know, more than half my life. Um, you know, for over 20 years now. Um, so, and these are conversations that we have anyway. A lot of these things that we talk about on the show are things that we talk about 
amongst ourselves all the time as far as trying, because we're always trying to get better. We're always, you know, kind of taking a step back and looking at our careers and looking at the things that we can improve um, as artists and as human beings. And, um, you know, it's, it's really cool to be able to have those conversations and have people actually learn from it. Um, over the time that we've done the podcast, people have started businesses because of what we talk about. People have, you know, started careers or even indie careers because we talk about things like that too. It's like, you know, if you're not doing something that you're supposed to be doing or you're not going to be, you know, go all in, you know, maybe it should just be a hobby for you. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I think that the podcast for even for us has been something that we go back and listen to episodes, you know, to kind of give ourselves a checklist about things that we do in our careers. Um, so, you know, it's been a blessing um, for both of us. And, you know, usually, you know, like we come to record and we're, you know, like talk, ready to talk about whatever we can to help you know, artists um, continue to grow and continue to to blossom. So, um, yeah, we drop episodes every Sunday um, on YouTube and they're usually available um, that Monday on all of your streaming platforms. So, yeah, check out Super Duty Tough Work. Absolutely. I think it's an amazing resource. And I was thinking that, you know, like when we were kind of starting out in like the nineties, the battle rap scene was a thing. And that was like kind of where you prove yourself. But then there was often older, you know, like you kind of get a mentor that kind of mm -hmm. shows you, you know, what the ins and outs of booking shows or, you know, whatever it is, how to hold the mic and those kinds of things. Right. Um, so it seems like, you know, hip hop is something that's um, like a folk art and, and it's kind of passed down. It's, you know, for the people, by the people, um, you're not going to school to learn it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but now that the, the context for hip hop is, you know, is worldwide and it's like the Internet and like there's an outlet, of course, of putting something on SoundCloud, but you might not have that mentorship mm -hmm. to kind of craft that work before it gets there or after it's up. And I think that something like this is a great resource that kind of demystifies all yeah. the, the bullshit and like, you know, and it gives a really kind of sober look at the, the ins and outs behind the scenes of the music industry and um, not, not just the industry, just like the artistic pursuit. You know, also you're letting your guard down, you're telling about mistakes, tell, t you know, mm -hmm. talking about your own experiences. Um, and what you've learned along the way. And I think it just humanizes the art form in a lot of ways. I think it's really necessary. So yeah, thanks I mean, for doing that. Yeah, for um, no problem. I mean, for us, you know, I think we realized that when we were coming up, we didn't have hip hop was a lot more secretive. You know, like even if you had people that were mentors to you, they didn't really give you all the secrets. You know what I mean? Like they told you enough to get you to a point where you could start to make your own path, but they didn't tell you, they didn't give you all the jewels. And, you know, I think, you know, we bumped our head a lot coming up as, you know, artists and we learned a lot and we made a lot of mistakes. Um, but in the process of making those mistakes, you know, we came out better on the end and we're trying to, you know, I think part of, our mission with the podcast is to help people not make as many mistakes. Yeah. And I think, I mean, so much of the, the music industry is about persona and performance. And I think mm -hmm. that's crept into everybody's daily life where, you know, we're crafting a public persona daily and that's reinforced, you know, by each tweet we put out or Instagram post. And this adds an, another dimension, I think, to the artist. Yeah. Um, that I think, like I said, it humanizes it. And I think it's it's really necessary and a great a great uh, resource for people. So definitely check that out. And yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you. Um, yeah, I'm, I love the new album. I'm glad you guys got back together after so long and, and yeah. picked up. Um, I think it has a, a really amazing energy to it. Um, and it was a, a joy for me to get to hear behind the scenes. So thank you. You as well. And um this is this is fun. Hopefully I can do this again. Get on here again with you guys. Hey, I hope you enjoy my talk with Illogic. I know I had a good time getting tuned in to the Columbus scene. Also hearing about his collaboration with one of my favorite weird rap outfits, Green Think. 
You can hear that in the Patreon bonus episode. We got in depth with each track off of Write the Ship, and it was interesting to hear about his specific writing process during this time. You know, what was going on in his orbit on a personal level and also a broader societal perspective while this was being made. One thing that came to my mind on this topic of process, and this is something that came up in a lot of my other talks as well, in one way or another, is a feeling that the author sometimes doesn't have total clarity or maybe doesn't have complete understanding of what the work is, often until after it's created and released. That's not to say there isn't always a high degree of intentionality or a conceptual thrust. There's this technical ability and command and control, of course, that goes into each song that the artist produces. But there's sometimes still an aspect of the work that they don't fully realize is there until after. It gets to the notion that there's a dimension of our minds that is in some way ahead of our more rational thought processes. You could say it's drawing from our subconscious, our collective consciousness, or even the spiritual realm. You can keep this point rooted in neuroscience or embracing the esoteric, but regardless, to me what's most exciting is that the genesis of this type of thought that's at first inaccessible to our rational minds, it chooses to be communicated in a manner that's unorthodox, expressive, stylized, and abstracted. It seems to naturally favor the poetic over the didactic. To paraphrase filmmaker Werner Herzog, I'm after the ecstatic truth and not the accountant's truth. I'm still rolling all these thoughts around and myself and I'm looking forward to seeing how this concept might come up in future interviews. Thanks for listening. I recently read Reese Langston's book, Language Arts Unit, which is an accompaniment to his 2020 album of the same title. I became a brown man in Los Angeles on a magazine cover. Man of color, mom, both of them interviewed and fumbled. My life scrunched down in Alia County inches. Became a black man downtown with a U turn in a business district. Between my first and spur romantic interest, where I set up on numbers. I think it's a super intelligent and difficult read. It required a fair amount of intense focus and looking up references, but I found that it really rewarded my efforts. It's basically a long essay that dissects and questions hip-hop culture, internet culture, and the general human condition, I guess. Uh, the essay is followed by lyric transcriptions from the album that really read like poetry, These aren't just your typical rap lyrics, and I think they arguably work better in printed form because they really do reward careful pondering. You know, and some of it is really just over my head, which is why I asked Andrew Mbaruk, aka Lil Ghost Rider, who is definitely smarter and more literary-minded than me, if he would do this book report instead of me. He declined. He said... I feel like that album slash book is its own book report. I'm uncertain of what I could say that would be as useful or as interesting as that essay. And he went on to say, I really dig the album. It gets better the more I hear it. And the accompanying essay is a brilliant move. I see that now. Any review or report has to consider the essay, which is more interesting than any report or review could be. Rhyming Eugene Onigan in Eugene, Oregon is necessary and right. That's the other thing I can say with certainty about the album. You can order the book directly from Reese Langston on his website, langstonia.org, or you can download it for free along with the album, which I highly recommend as well. And Reese has a new album coming out on May 5th called Stalin Bollywood which I've had the privilege of hearing in advance, and I'm really excited about that. It's a, Sonically, it's like a fusion of rap with 80s new wave or post-punk elements. And lyrically, kind of like the book, I guess, it's continuing to explore and question our mass media-generated culture 
and the role of sensationalism in society. So, yeah, I, I highly recommend all of Reese Langston's work. That's R H Y S Langston, L A N G S T O N. A couple album recommendations. Uh, Serengeti recently released an album, Curse of the Polo. He did not promote the album at all. I asked if he would come on the show and talk about it. He respectfully declined. Um, it's really interesting how Serengeti releases his music and presents it to the world as if he just wants it to speak for itself, which I admire. And I really love this collection of songs. Um, it's a breezy listen, nine tracks. I think about half of them came out as rare, hard-to-find releases, and the other half I don't think came out before. And I'll just, you know, I'll let the music speak for itself. I had a rhyme in my sock called when water freezes About something, about something that I read in some book Man, it's here somewhere Can you feel the pink pelican sound? Ferragamo's filthy, flip my steez Serengeti's secret message, past ready I'm not ready to go to bed yet Master of the forgotten style of the world Called coiled milk Secret message behind the smile. There's a rose behind the melody. There's a pigeon behind. There's some stuff that you can listen to. Today, all day today. Master Usher, Master Usher. This is how it goes. I recommend that. It's at one of his three band camps. This one's at SerengetiDave.bandcamp.com. And another album I'll recommend is. Sharkula and Mux, Take Caution on the Beach, is the name of their new album. It's their second together. And um, if you're not familiar with Sharkula, I think he's a really interesting rapper. His approach is really one of a kind, partially written, partially freestyled. He comes across as really silly and sincere at the same time. He seems like a good-hearted person and a, a free thinker. I spoke with him in the past, and he was talking about how he prefers his vocals raw and unaffected, which I guess allows for the original spirit and essence of the vocal performance to shine and in an imperfect and rough-around-the-edges way. You know, sometimes it seems a little offbeat or like he's you know, struggling to come up with the next line off the top of his head. But I think it's really rare that you get to hear someone present their work as an MC in that manner and not be afraid to to put it out there like that, warts and all. He told me actually that he wasn't happy with the way his previous album with Mux came out, the way that his vocals were affected and apparently that sentiment was taken into consideration with this new release because the vocals sound more or less untouched in post-production and as with the first album they're backed by some really strange inventive music by Mux which I think should again just maybe speak for itself when should wife for baby in a bulletproof vest I understand beyond diaper Dice deep now we ain't we're kind of chilling like a veterinarian maybe a villain by who's your door been the rain is pouring yo is your name Lauren I see you around the way like Benny Hill nobody's perfect all making mistakes but we learn from our mistakes but if you still get headaches so you're making the same mistakes over and over and i'll recommend a podcast uh waiting on reparations is sort of a mixture of leftist politics and hip-hop it's hosted by dope knife and lingua franca both mcs and unlike a lot of political podcasts that end up making me feel sort of depressed and hopeless. 
I feel like they somehow managed to maintain a a positive outlook and they're focusing on changes that people can work towards. They both seem well informed, not preachy or condescending. I like their tone. Lingua Franca is especially enthusiastic and apparently engaged in activism in a way that's inspiring. And I like how they incorporate hip hop into the podcast. For example, the recent episode called Hip Propaganda looked at the ways in which hip hop has been weaponized to disseminate pro government or anti government propaganda. In general, I say the show is just really well researched and well produced. And if that sounds interesting to you, then I recommend waiting on reparations. And in some weird rap news, uh, we recently launched the Weird Rap Radio Show on Spaz Radio. That's an internet and pirate FM station run by Spaz, the semi-permanent autonomous zone. That's a completely ad-free network run by a nebulous collective of open-minded individuals, artists, etc. It's all non-profit, non-hierarchical. Uh, The Weird Rap Radio Show is every Sunday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, lasts for about an hour, and it's hosted by a rotating cast of DJs. You can listen and chat with us live at spaz.radio, and you can check out past episodes at mixcloud.com slash weirdrap. There's a couple in the vaults there already. And uh, I want to take the time to talk about Shock G, who uh, we lost recently. Shock G of Digital Underground, probably one of my first introductions to what I'd consider weird rap music. And the list of things that that Shock G did, I, I think, is pretty impressive. You know, many people know that he basically introduced Tupac to the world. He can be credited with introducing the concept of multiple aliases and characters with masks and costumes that was later embraced by artists like Cool Keith and MF Doom. And Shock G was not only the leader of Digital Underground, but he had a ton of different aliases under which he would play a variety of roles in the group, from various vocalists, including Humpty Hump and MC Blowfish, to instrumentalists like The Piano Man, to even the the graphic artist alias Rackadelic, under which he designed all their iconic cover art. And he also produced or co-produced all the group's work as part of the Underground Railroad production team. He worked on various projects by Tupac, AC Alone, and others. And one thing that I think is really admirable is throughout Digital Underground's discography and the couple of solo releases that Shock G had, he really stayed true to his artistic vision. He never really seemed to conform to the trends of the time, and they always kind of remained uncompromising, and I really respect that. Famously, on their second album, Sons of the P, they had the song Heartbeat Props, which speaks about recognizing great artists while they're alive rather than waiting till they're gone to celebrate them. And unfortunately, I think that's exactly the fate that befell Shock G. And I will say that as for myself, this monologue has been more or less paraphrasing an article that I published about a year ago, because I think it is important to try and recognize these artists before they're gone. And that is one of the main missions of Weird Rap. So uh, if you like what we're doing, please spread the word, subscribe to the podcast, the YouTube, the Bandcamp, etc. Get a t-shirt. You can find all that stuff at weirdrap.com. If you'd like to give us a rating or review, which would be much appreciated, you can go to weirdrap.com slash rating. Again, there's a whole extra half hour of awesome conversation with Odd Nostom and Logic plus an exclusive unreleased track, which is truly beautiful by the two of them, at patreon.com slash weird rap. For just three bucks a month, you get that, all past and future monthly bonus episodes, 
plus the Weird Rap Discussion Gang After Hours talks. And for just five bucks a month, you get all that plus some Weird Rap stickers and access to the Weird Rap Discussion Gang talks live where you can interact with us via text. That's patreon.com slash weird rap. Till next time, let your weirdness shine. And in the immortal words of Shock G, do what you like, act how you like. And if a doo-doo chump punk points a finger like a stunt, tell him step up, I'm doing the hump. hump.